more time for Chad Moha. Amen. Can we say thank you to Pastor John and Lene and the team leading us in worship? Amen. Those were very nice words, John. I was on the verge of tears that you compared my preaching to a roller coaster ride. Um, John is easily one of my very best friends in the whole world. Uh, the only reason I drink Banner coffee is because I get to see him like five days a week. That's the honest truth. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, 38 years old. I have a beautiful wife. Raise your hand, Haley. And all my four children, everybody say hello to my beautiful family out there. My mother and father-in-law, Joe and Dora, everybody say hello. Woosties. And Radiant, uh, we're in a season of transition, so we're, they're meeting in Santa Maria at a park um, in a bilingual context. It's amazing. So bless you, Radiant family, if for some reason you would watch this later on YouTube. Um, just a little bit about my story. I, I, uh, I was raised in a beautiful Christian family, just to give you a little context for the word I'm going to share today. And I, I grew up knowing the call of God. I remember as a junior high bo little boy, my youth pastor told me I had a few minutes to speak, which you'll find as the message uh, continues. That's an impossibility, a few minutes. And I remember the Holy said, yeah, thank you. Just laugh at the jokes. It'll go faster and better. Um, and I just remember, I remember as a junior high student, I'm junior high. I remember the Holy Spirit, that, that it just, it, the, the Spirit was so gripping my spirit that he was going to move in, in youth group that night, big grew up in a big church in Kansas City, and I was like, Pastor Chris, I think I need more than a few minutes. He's like, okay, junior higher. You know, thankfully, he gave me a few more minutes. I preached the gospel, and 60 kids came forward to respond to the gospel. I was just this little, you know, and then I did the, kind of the high school thing, in and out, in and out, and then I was 16. I got in trouble. My sister told my, my dad, he's six foot four, 400 pounds, 6'5", actually, big dog. And uh, I, she, told, she told my dad, she broke the sibling rule, which every good sibling that's following Jesus should break. You should tell on your siblings if they're not walking with God. My sister told on me, Chad's partying, doing stupid stuff, even though he's known the call of God. And my dad called me into his office, you know, deep voice, beard, glasses, the whole deal. And he said, son, what are you doing? That's all he said. And then he told every 16-year-old boy his two favorite things. Number one, you can't go anywhere but to school and to church. So that was sort of supposed to be a joke again. But I said, well, great. Well, at that time, I, again, the big church I grew up in in Kansas City was having prayer meetings every night. So as a 16-year-old boy, I was bored at home. I, I drove and I went to this prayer meeting that was mostly old ladies I'm dead serious. I'm not joking. I've been leading prayer meetings since I was a teenager. It's usually older ladies, but God is adding to the mix men and women of every age. And yeah, amen. And, and I remember, I, I just again, for a little bio, I, I, I remember I didn't even make it to the altar. I just knelt in the front pew. And it was so interesting. Up to this point, I've been to many summer camps, many retreats, many conferences. I grew up in kind of a revival type culture. Lots of, like, respond to the altar, respond to the altar. This time it was different. Um, there was no sermon. It was a prayer meeting. And I remember my dad, huge bear paw on my shoulder. He said, son, would you like to pray? You know, and he kind of, you know, <laughs> do I have a choice here? No, he didn't do that. I said, of course, daddy, I want to pray. And so we knelt. And it's so interesting. All these other experiences with the Lord, there were, it was accompanied by lots of tears, lots of emotion. But I remember, man, I'm 38. This is 22 years ago. I knelt on the front row, and I just prayed with no emotion. God, you don't want me to just do good. You want me to be good. You don't want me to just do holy. You want me to be holy. So can you come, Jesus, and change me at my core, my nature? And so for two weeks, I, my dad started bringing home. He mentioned passages of Scripture memorized. My dad used to 
Remember those like yellow notepads, those memo notepads? Give me a thumbs up for anyone who still writes with paper. And he used to bring me home scripture to memorize. Romans, I remember Romans chapter 8, 28 through 35, that, that we're more than conquerors in Jesus. I just started reading. I'd get up an hour early to pray. My brother kind of came back to the Lord. We would pray an hour in the morning. He would always fall asleep. And so I'd throw pillows at him. We shared a room at this time. And I'd read the Bible an hour a day. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying I was, my logic was I was really good at being a sinner. So I thought I would take at least that much energy and aim it towards Jesus. Come on, somebody. And so, and so I started reading and praying. And, and so, but really no emotion for two, two weeks. Later, I was in my room. I was, again, I was 16 years old. And I was just kneeling beside, beside my bed praying. And I just started weeping uncontrollably. And I go into my dad's room, and I'm like, Dad, I didn't, like, get drunk. I didn't do anything bad. Why am I crying? And he's like, son, just go talk to Jesus. He'll tell you. And so I go back to my room, and at this point, this was way before the days of MP3s and iPods. I was listening to this song about the holiness of God. And there was this one moment of, like, this eight-minute song that was really anointed. And so remember CDs, how you used to rewind CDs? Yeah, I just, I remember, it was so like the anointing would fall and then it would leave when I was rewinding the CD. And then the anointing would fall and, the, you know, you'd press the rewind button on a CD. And I just, over and over and over about the holiness of God and how God who is holy wants to make us holy too. And I, the Lord's like, Chad, that's what I did in you. As a 16-year-old teenager, I literally gave you a heart that was pure. I, I put my word in you so that you could not just like sort of stumble the rest of your like adolescent and teenage years through sin. I put my spirit in you so you could walk in victory. And so I haven't ever gotten over it. You know, a lot's happened in 22 years. I basically had a perfect record. Ask my wife. I'm kidding. But I just tell you that story just to give you a little bit. You'll understand why I gave you this story because the, the number one secret, if you get anything today, and they didn't give me a time when I should be done, so I'll just kind of read the audience. I can't see you because of the light, so I won't be able to read you. But um, I gave you this context because I believe in two things. Number one, I believe the grace of God can transform any life in this room because he did for me. So that's number one, what you'll hear. Yes, even teenagers. Come on, Jack announced it. I'm telling you, God can get a hold of a teenage person's heart, and he can so get a hold of it that they don't ever have to wander away. Again, we don't, we're not just entertaining children and kids. We're raising up the future generation of giant slayers. Amen? Those who would conquer in Christ and through Christ. So number one, I believe that God can change any person in this room. And then number two, I believe if I have anything to impart or to encourage, if you will set as the habit or, or, or a main objective of your life to become a student of God's word, there will be storms that are coming, difficulties and adversities are inevitable. But if you put the word in you, there's nothing that the enemy can throw at you on your path that you won't be able to overcome because you're building your life on an unshakable foundation of the word of the Lord. And so I just really want to encourage those two things. The grace of God can touch anybody. And that I just pray that the Lord would provoke you. That many of us, when we think about the summer, we think about it's like a time to check out, you know. But I want, John and I have been joking. I don't think either of us have enough courage to speak this to our congregations yet. But what if everyone in this room canceled all of their Netflix subscriptions and instead of all of those times now that you're going to have to like binge watch, you put those towards spiritual kingdom endeavors and purposes? Again, none of us, we don't have courage to tell our congregation. So I'm a guest speaker telling you in a special, what if all of those margin moments, instead of just reaching, binging, doling and numbing that our spiritual senses over the next two months were the sharpest going into the fall that they've ever been. I think it'd be cool. So anyhow, that's a little bit about me. I have an amazing wife. I have four beautiful children. Mackenzie's nine, Caleb is seven, Benji is five, Ethan is three, and we have no more on the way. <laughs> gotcha. I almost gotcha. 
So uh, it's just a joy and a delight to be here with you. And so let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your word would come alive, that we would experience the grace of God that would lead us deeper into your heart, Father. Lord, I thank you that your word is powerful. It's like a sword. It's like fire. It's like water. It's like bread. It's like a hammer. (laughs) I love your word. We love your word. We thank you that you're a God that's revealed himself to us. We are not orphans. We are adopted sons and daughters who have direct access to the heart of the Father through the grace of the Son and the divine escort called the Holy Spirit. So would you come and teach us, Holy Spirit? I pray that as we open our Bibles, that the Bible would open us and we would have fertile soil that's good so that when you deposit the seeds of your kingdom, everyone in this room would just have a big all caps yes on the inside and that your word could accomplish its purpose for which you are sending it forth this morning. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. The title of today's talk is called It's the End of the World. Now what? Clever title. That's as clever as it's going to get, so you should just just kind of giggle and be happy. Um, The the main text, we're going to get to 1 Peter chapter 4, but before we get to 1 Peter chapter 4, um, I just want to share a little bit of background. I really want to encourage you. Brother Peter's got some fire in his letters, okay? This week, I reread both letters and just hung out. If you're looking like, where should I read in the Bible? Go to the Peters. Turn to your neighbor and say, go to the Peters. They're solid, super solid. I would say underrated. They're at the end of your Bible. Maybe you kind of skip over them between, you know, I don't know, the, the, the first John and you go straight to Revelation or, you know, but you need, you need, to, you need to spend some time in the Peters because I believe um, the, the context in which Peter is writing to the church, it's very relevant for our time. So I'm just going to give you like the, the briefest expose of the first four chapters a week. Because how many know the Bible is it's written to a specific people in a specific place who are experiencing specific challenges. And it's written, it was written to a people that still has relevance for your life and my life. If you agree, can you say amen? And so Peter is writing to a group of believers who they have no safety net. They don't have a place that's prominent in culture. Can I get an amen? Sound familiar so far? They're being ostracized. They're, 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 they're viewed sort of like cockeyed sideways, like these weird people. They don't really participate in like emperor worship. And so there, there's nothing about like for them to, to identify as a Jesus follower. There's nothing in their cultural moment the people Peter's writing to, if they would speak up and say, we follow Jesus, nothing about that confession would get them ahead in the marketplace and the workplace or in their world. In fact, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were being, persecution was about ready to be really ratchet up under, under the emperor Domitian. And, and so Peter's writing to, to a people that are, are really wrestling with this issue of um, increased hostility Anyone feel that in the cultural air that we breathe? Can you just raise your hand at me just so I can see you? So he's written to this people who kind of feel like a little bit disoriented, like things are not currently as they sort of were. Like, like, like all of those things that Christians used to be able to rely on are sort of like they're not there. There's nothing. And so he's writing to a people who are, who, who are literally considered, one of his favorite words are exiles, strangers, foreigners in the world. Like they, they're, they're sojourners. They're, and I love this. In the fir- whole first three chapters, Peter is so, so encouraging the, these believers that though they feel homeless in the world, they have a God they can call Father and a family called the church to belong to. That though they, though they feel sort of helpless, like they're at the bottom of the totem pole of their cultural like hierarchy and structure, though they feel hopeless, they have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they have an inheritance in heaven that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So that they're not homeless, and they're not hopeless, and they're not helpless with the, the power of Rome swirling about. They have been sanctified right there in the first three verses, but first two verses, by the Holy Spirit. So say this with me. As a believer, you're not homeless. I'm not homeless. I'm not hopeless. And I'm not helpless. 
that there is God's goodness in our cultural moment. We have a home in the Father's love. We have hope through the resurrection of Jesus, and we have help through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so he's writing to encourage these guys who feel, just feel the squeeze and the pressure of their cultural moment. And he tells them, though, that they're, though they're rejected by their culture, you can't make this stuff up. It's for today. Though they're rejected by their culture, he reminds them that there's somebody else that they're looking to who also knows what it is to be rejected. Named Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. That Jesus was the one who was rejected by men. And even though all rejected him, the fact that he was chosen by the Father was the most significant uh, uh, anchor point for their faith. That even though they feel rejected and ostracized, they are chosen together with Christ to belong to God in his love and mercy. So he tells them that they're chosen, they're royal, that even though they're in this war, not just around them, but they're, that how many have ever known what it is to have the inner war, the inner wrestle? So Peter's like, there's victory in both battles. Amen. How many believe there's victory to stand in our cultural moment? And there's also victory to overcome the, 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 the anxiety and the fear and the difficulty within. So there's, there's victory. And then he tells them, to be encouraged that as they, they're suffering for their faith, that their suffering is not the end of their story. Amen. So that's like the little bit of the background. So now the end of the world. That's 1 Peter 1 through, 1 through 4, really. It says this in verse 7. Can you help me with the clicker? I'm just going to have you help me out. Thank you. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Can you say thanks be to God? And so, and this is like my favorite passage. I feel like if I did get a tattoo, I'd want all of this on me somewhere. It's power packed. We're just gonna old school expositional sermon. We're gonna walk through this passage because I believe this passage is the play that the church is meant to run here at the end of the age. I don't think we have to like, how do we be clever in our cultural moment? We feel the pressure and the hostility and we're sort of like viewed as weird. We are weird, John said it. That was really encouraging, by the way. We do weird things. We're like generous, right? It's weird. But this passage in five verses, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, in six verses, I believe has a, a strategy for an end time people not to cower in our corner and suck our spiritual thumbs, but to step into the plans and purposes of God. Come on, someone say amen. There is, God has a plan and a purpose. So the passage starts, the end of all things is near. Now, unfortunately, because of all of the false predictions, because of all the books, you know, 1987, how many remember those books? The, the Help me, someone who's older than me. Okay, I got some hands raised back here. You know, the end of the world, was it Hal Lindsey? Okay. Anyway, left me, all the series is that when we hear Peter say the end of all things is near, it's easy for us to like roll our collective spiritual eyes like, yeah, right, we've heard that. And unfortunately, to us when we hear it, we're so deprogrammed and now like the number one genre of movie and book is like apocalyptic zombie. Come on, raise your hand at me. And so not only like does like the biblical like it's the end of the age. We're so like weirdly programmed by Bruce Willis, Armageddon, nuclear stuff that like when we read a passage like this in 1 Peter 4, 7, we're like, the end. And unfortunately, this is what most of us think. Like, when, like, this is how most of us would like hear the sound or the alarm that's the end of the age. I have a video, a perfect example for how you and I view the end of the age. Okay. It's the end of all things. Throw it again. Sound the alarm. Say, wake up. Fisher Price trumpet, wake up, it's the end of all things. Okay, you can be done, thank you. That was just a cute chance for me to show you my son. 
But that's how most of us, when we read a passage in the Bible, again, this was written 2,000-something years ago, the end of all things, sure. It has no, no repercussions on our life. It doesn't like, like jar us from our complacency or our sin, and we're just kind of like, yeah, cool. Like, like, next show, next episode on Netflix. We have no grid, right, because we're so inundated by other messaging and other, like, theories and ideologies and opinions and agendas, but I want you to know Peter's first word before he gives us all of these imperatives, all of these things that the end time church is meant to be doing so that they're ready for when Christ returns, it's to alert us that we are at the end of all things. What part of the story are we on? Since the life, death, resurrection, ascension, when Christ sat down, we have been in the last days. Say it with me, we're in the last days. And there's two things that are coming. Number one, there is a day of reckoning. Say reckoning. The reckoning is written about multiple times in the Bible, but Acts chapter 17 in particular, Peter's preaching in Athens, and at the very end of the message, he says, judgment and justice are coming through the man that God the Father raised up. His name is Jesus. There's a day of reckoning coming at the end of the age where God will bring judgment and justice. How many know we need both? And then number two, there's also a day of restoration. Acts chapter 3 says that Jesus is on a restoration project. He, how many believe he doesn't want 2 Peter 3, 9? Again, Brother Peter, second letter. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance and faith through Jesus Christ. So he's, he's not only his reckoning coming, but he's trying to restore people to himself through the church and the gospel ministry so that when the reckoning comes, there's more and more who are delighting in his justice and judgment than those who are living like in light of he, they need to be judged and they need his justice. How many believe we have an assignment in 2022? Okay, seven of you will talk after service. You are the future. So there's the day of reckoning and the day of restoration. And so Peter's like this, like again, in light of the end, what, what many of us, if we would just take our cues from like sort of cultural Christianity and from like all of the shows and movies and sci-fi films, if, if the end is coming, here's how the story would go for most of us. Build a bomb shelter bunker, buy 55-gallon water bottles, get a bunch of rice and beans or whatever you eat, and just hunker down and, you know, just wait for, wait for Jesus, you know? But it's so interesting that Peter's very next phrase, the end of all things is near, therefore, everyone say therefore, therefore, be so, be clear, be alert and of sober mind. Say that with me, be alert and of sober mind. So in other words, in light of the time in which we live, Peter apparently, be, he's, he's apparently coaching us that in the end of the age, where most of the battle is either going to be won or lost is in our minds. Be alert and of sober mind. Be awake and attentive. Have your mind turned on and then tuned in to what I am doing. Elsewhere in the scriptures, I don't have time because of the time that it is, but we're called to have a mind that's governed, say governed by the Spirit, Romans chapter 8. We're meant to have a mind that's guided by the mind of Christ himself, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. And we're, have, we're to have a mind that's guarded, say guarded, by the peace of God as we live a lifestyle of rejoicing and petition and thanksgiving. And Peter's like, in light of the time in which it's in, you can't afford to have your mind dull, sluggish, and sleepy. Come on, elbow your neighbor right now and say he's talking to you. So in light of what time it is in the story of God, be alert. Hello, be alert. Remember Ethan's video. Be alert and of sober mind. Let me unpack those words. To be alert, it literally means don't be sluggish, sleepy, distracted, or dismayed. Can we do an altar call right now and break that off of all of our minds? I'm dead serious. I'm not kidding. And I'm kidding. He's not paying me by quota, but right now, if we did the altar call, we could all come. Come on, give me a thumbs up. This isn't heavy or mean-spirited. I'm just telling you, the enemy is kicking our... Listen, I remember I was driving this week praying about this Sunday. I was thinking, oh my gosh, 
We've never had more access to having our minds clouded, sluggish than any time in history than right now. It's called your smartphone. And I was thinking, of course, at the end of the end of the age in which we're living, there would be all time the smorgasbord of sluggishness, sleepiness, distraction, dismay, and discouragement. Or you could just watch the news as a lifestyle and throw in fear, frenzy, fight, and I, I had another F earlier today, but I forgot the other F. I was going to say that, but I didn't want to get in trouble, so he said it. Come on, the very first thing in light of the time it is on the story is to be alert. Don't be sluggish. How many right now would say, Chatty, my mind far too often has this like lull, this fog, this sleepiness, this like this veil over it, whether because of our habits, because of the things we ingest or listen to. And Peter's saying, if you want to be in on what I'm doing in your generation, and in particular in the generation in which I return, we got to talk about the state of your mind. Be alert. Don't be sluggish, sleepy, distracted, or dismayed. Number two, oh gosh, it just gets gnarlier. Be sober-minded. Look, literally the language, like sober. Don't be intoxicated by the spirit of the age. A reed swayed by the cultural winds or influenced by the various voices vying for our affection, attention, and allegiance. How many believe many of us have minds that are intoxicated, but not by life and the spirit, but by the spirit of the age, if we're honest? Can we be honest today? Come on. We can be honest. And so like he's saying, the end of all things is near. So let's talk about your mindset. You've got to be alert. He talks about the devil in chapter, chapter 5, um, verse 8, 9, and 10, where the devil's, he's like a roaring lion seeking to devour those who aren't, like tuned, who aren't turned on to the grace of God and tuned in to the voice of God. How many know you need to be on and then tuned in? So be alert and of sober mind. And why does he say this? This is so interesting. Why, who cares? Why do I need to be alert? Why do I need to be sober-minded? This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. So that you may pray. You don't understand how many of us pray out of our frantic, drunk, intoxicated minds that are sluggish and sleepy. We're not praying sharp and attentive to the voice of God. We're praying out of the narratives that are more forming and filling us than the word of the Lord. And so we're frenzied, and it's just always chaos and a frenzy. And then when we wake up, we feed the frenzy through the newsreel or through your social media feed. And before you know it, we're just one, like, a, just a big chaos ball. And I love Peter. It's so incredible. The, the, the language, it literally says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be, sober mind, be, be alert and of sober mind. And I love that it doesn't say so that you can pray or even that you will pray. Come on, someone. It says so that you may pray. Why are we doing all these early morning prayer meetings with the men and, and we're gonna, there's, there's more that are launching, just listen for announcements. Because we believe in the posture of prayer, it's when we get a front row seat to the wisdom and counsel of God. And I'm telling you, we're gonna need all of the resources of God for the hour in which we live. We're gonna need what he's seeing, we're gonna need what he's saying, we're gonna need what he's thinking, what he's feeling and what he's doing so that we can take our cues from heaven and not from the, the surrounding culture so that you may pray. Like live so that you can pray. Oh, I don't have time. Go. Connects. So why prayer? Because prayer connects us to a person. And who is that person? Jesus. At its core, we're, we're not sluggish or distracted or dismayed. We're not intoxicated by the narratives and theories. We've got to like like, how, how many know he's got to bring us out so that he can bring us in? And some of us, maybe the word for you this morning is you need to come out of that, like, that reel, that cycle of just junk and gunk and garbage that's fueling your heart and your mind. And your step today is, Lord, maybe this summer I need to come out of that mess so that you can reprogram me and send me back into the game with your mind and with your spirit and your word. And so why so that you may pray? Because Peter knows that the only way that the church at the end of the age is going to overcome the spirit of the age is be, by being connected to a person named Jesus. Prayer at its core is not telling God things he doesn't know. At its core, it's about relating to a person. 
I wrote this definition. I'm not saying it's cutesy or clever, but I like it personally. P- prayer is learning to, I, I, did I put it on the notes? I did. Yeah, there it is. Learning, read it with me. Learning to respond to the initiating reach of God for relational enjoyment and empowered partnership in his kingdom for his glory and our good. It's those two things. One of the, my favorite parts about prayer is that actually you get to enjoy a person on the other end of the line. Come on, someone say amen. In prayer, and the, the word open, especially in a corporate context, I'm, I'm getting to hear his voice and see dynamics of his character and his nature revealed through my brothers and my sisters. And the words, the spirit's moving. The word is like filling it in and sustaining it. And so the first part of prayer, and that's why I wrote this definition, it's not so much telling God things that we need or that we want him to do. The first step of sustainable, enjoyable prayer is to realize he wants you to enjoy him and he wants you to know that he enjoys you. Oh, come on, someone say, he enjoys me. That's why he wants me to spend time with him in prayer. And so, and hello, you see how I put the language? It's learning to respond. Everyone say, respond. We never initiate getting God involved in a situation. We only learn to respond to his initiation and reach. Number one, to enjoy the relationship, and then out of that enjoyment, what does he want to do? Put his arm around us, and what does he want to say? We've got something to do. He wants to empower us for partnership. Turn to your neighbor and say, he wants to empower you for partnership. So, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded. Be, be, it's, I memorized it in the 1984 NIV version. I'm so sorry. Why did 2011 have to change everything I memorized my whole life? Ah, no one gets that. If you understand, if you're an NIV person, you get it. Pray for me. They changed it on me. So to be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. In light of everything we're gonna now just blitz through here at the end of this chapter, All of it takes its cue from these first two sentences. Know what time it is. Say that with me. Know what time it is. The end of all things is near. Like, let God transform our minds so that we're alert, attentive. Not only are we powered up, but we're also tuned in so that we may pray. Everything else Peter's going to write is going to flow from these realities. We know what time it is. Our minds are sharp, they're alert because we're participating and partnering with the grace of God. We're in a prayerful posture so that we're connected to a person for relationship and partnership. And in light of all of that, he's gonna give us very helpful tools that I, would, that I, I think I'd speak with authority for on behalf of John. This one passage alone could transform or breathe fresh life on all of your e-groups. If you just say, let's do 1 Peter 4, 7 through 12 together. Like, let's let's live out of this passage. Last little bit, just because I like to give shout outs for prayer. Skip a couple slides. Prayer is the one thing in the Bible you can do your own study. Read this with me. Don't read the passages. Just to do without ceasing for all people in every circumstance and to never give up doing. Screenshot that. It's beautiful. It's the only thing in the Bible. Prayer is to do without ceasing for all people in every circumstance and to never give up doing. How many want to sign up this summer to grow in prayer? This summer to grow in prayer. How to learn how to relate to God. Okay, out of prayer, what does he want us to do? Oh, I'm a prayer person. I don't like the next part. I love doing prayer meetings. Can I just testify? I love sitting at the piano and worshiping and it just being me and Jesus. Come on, somebody. Anyone else love me and Jesus time? Come on, anyone besides the front three rows? Anyone back there? I love this. Out of the context of prayer, he says this. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So a, a culture that's committed to prayer is equally, the reason why we're committed to prayer first is because we're surrounded by knuckleheads. I'm in that knucklehead group who's imperfect, who has a bunch of sharp edges, right? Who's a work in progress. Come on, turn to your neighbor. You're a work in progress. Bless you, brother or sister. <laughs> Come on. And so a prayer culture, how many, how many believe there's room to grow as, at Equippers as a prayer culture, a culture that communes with heaven and releases what God's doing, what he's saying, thinking, feeling, etc. 
And I love this, out of that call to pray, he's like, above all now, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. How many know biblical Christianity is never just one-dimensional, vertical? It always, and it bugs me, Jesus, because the horizontal's harder. It's always vertical, horizontal. What's the great commandment? Help me out. Come on. They're giving chocolates away, I heard, after service, if you answer the preacher. Love God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, praise God. John, I wish John, I like, I like John, I guess. John the Apostle. In 1 John 4, 19, the Apostle John has the audacity to say, don't say you love God if you don't love people. Ugh. Okay, John. So out of a prayer culture, it's meant, to, it's meant to be a culture that's committed to each other and the long game of each other's transformation. How many are thankful slash that the first definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 is that love is patient, or my King James family, it's long-suffering. Come on, that's helpful. <laughs> or the new King James version, whatever your, whatever your flavor. This is on purpose. How many know that's how God loves us? The long view. Come on, come on. The long view. I see you're in from your current reality, and I'm going to coach you and encourage you for it. I know your potential even when you don't, and even when it's really hard for others to see it, but I see it. So out of this culture of prayer, at the end of the age, where our minds are coming out of the sluggishness and sleepiness of the hour, we're then committed to playing the long game with each other. I just have a few, what, literally if you study the language, it's a, it's a love that is deep, constant, and covenantal. A, com, a community that's committed to repentance over rebellion, reconciliation over retaliating or retreating, and then we learn to play the long game of patient love with each other. How many need patient love? Every hand should be raised. And the reality is this. If you study the scriptures, you cannot sustain prayer, which was Peter's, I would argue, like sort of main point of this passage. You can't sustain prayer if you're offended with your brothers and sisters. Blah. You just can't. Jesus is like, leave your gift there, Matthew 5, 16 through like 23. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversaries, taking you to court. Like Jesus is like, I appreciate the songs. I appreciate the prayers. I appreciate it all. But if there's odds between you and a brother or sister, like take care of that business first. And so he's saying, like, be committed to prayer, but just so you know, you're going to need the resources that I alone can release into a community committed to prayer, amen? But out of that is then now a commitment to love each other with long game patient love, which is to be a community that's committed to reconciliation. How many believe it's easier to run away? Every hand raised. But that's what the world does. I was watching, no, oh, forget it, don't have time. I was going to give a good example, but it was a movie. Um, we, we, skip. We have no context for long game love. We have no context, but the church is meant to walk with patient long game love. And I love this. Okay, keep going. Hurry up. I think I got up here at like 1110, so I'm doing good. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Ten? All right. So out of love, I love this. I love that after love, I love this. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Do you see the flow? Your mind alert, attentive, it's the end. Prayer, love that plays the long game. Open your hearts. How many believe this passage alone could revolutionize the church in 2022? How many believe a movement of kingdom hospitality would cause our current cultural reality to drop their collective jaw? You're hanging out with those people? You're making space at your table for them? You're showing hospitality and kindness. And, and Peter's like, guys, when you have nothing on the outside to get you ahead culturally, you have to model a different culture that will cause people to ask the question, why? Why are you that way? And so he says, offer hospitality. How many have been transformed through the spirit of hospitality? Raise your hand. Come on, the way to the heart is through the belly. Oh, man, lunch is coming. Let's go, finish. 
And I love it. He says, without grumbling. Everyone say, without grumbling. You know what? I was reflecting on this, and I don't like it. You know why? Because how many know that it, without grumbling, at some point we have to stop wishing we were in a different community instead of embracing those that the Lord has within arm's distance of us. Amen? Without grumbling, comparing, c- complaining, or, com- or, or, or com- uh, competition. Jesus wants to release a tidal wave of hospitality in, hospitality in and through his church for our cultural moment. They may not come to a service, but they'll come to a meal. So everyone's saying, now we're at the table. Hospitality. Now what happens at that table? Hurry up. At that table that's been set, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Did you know that at the table, every member matters, every part gets to play, every person has a gift and a grace on their life, and it's needed to reveal the multifaceted, dynamic reality of who God is. If you're in this room, you're like, I'm not gifted, you are not believing the truth, you're believing the enemy. You have a gift, you have grace on your life that God actually wants to activate at, a, at the table so that at that table, the fullness of God is on display because you've stepped into your, your destiny and place and purpose. Each of you, say each of you, should use whatever gift you've received. How many know the gifts aren't for us, they're for each other? Oh, how many think we've gotten a little sideways in all the gift kind of language and it's look who the gift it is, look who the gift, but our gifts are not for us, they're for others. Come on, somebody, say amen. The reason he's given me gifts is not for me, it's for you. And the reason he's given you gifts is not just for you, it's for me, it's for us. And we need the grace of God released in and through the church, not through a selected few, but through, but through a mobilized many. Come on, someone say it. I have grace. I have a gift. It's not for me. It's for them. It's for us. And so God wants to activate those graces and those gifts. We're almost done. And it goes on to say, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. How many believe the day of like like muzzled Christianity has to be over? We need to begin to become those people who speak God's words to each other. Come on, how many believe we need the prophetic voice of God restored to his church? So we're not saying what we're hearing on the highlight reel or the news. We need to be say yes to becoming a people who will speak the prophetic word of God and the, the written word of God in a culture of chaos and compromise and clouded confusion. We need to step into that place at that table and begin to speak as if speaking the very words of God. We need it. We need the word of the Lord. Amen. And it's not like heavy, thus says the Lord. I'm just saying that we would become people who say yes to being saturated in his word. I love Peter. Look how nonchalant he sort of is with that that admonition. If anyone speaks, turn to your neighbor. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one speaking the very words of God. How many believe we are at an all-time high necessity hour that we would be a church and a people that hear what God is saying, that see what God is doing, feel what God is feeling, and go where God is leading? And how many believe he releases all four of those things through his voice and through his word? How many in this room have ever grown tired or weary? Every hand raised, hallelujah. I love that he says, if anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. How many need fresh strength today? So that in all things, I love it. I don't have time. I'm just going to land the plane here. I put this in my notes that the, at that table where there's love, long game love, patient love, amen, where each part's being activated in their gift and their grace, where we're learning to speak God's word uh, prophetically, we're speaking the gospel, what God has done through Jesus over each other. Out of that environment, All things God may be praised. The table always tilts toward Jesus. Come on, say that with me. The table tilts towards Jesus. 
He's at the center. He's at the head. I wrote this. Jesus is the aim of our affection and the center of our attention and the only worthy recipient of our wholehearted allegiance. So I don't know how you need to respond today. I have these notes. I'll email them to John. Like literally, you could just rip them apart. Don't take my word for it. Read it yourself in the word. But I believe that there are actually some people here today who are like, Chatty, I need an upgrade in the software of my mind. My mind is sluggish. It's full of all sorts of garbage and lies. And I, I, I need the Holy Spirit to, to clear my thinking and my mindset. I need, to, I need a gospel reset. I need, listen, it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And if that's you, if you just, it's just like step number one, you would say, I need a reset on my mind. I need the grace of God to heal my mind. Could you just stand on your feet as we minister just here for a minute or two? Just stand on your feet. You would just say, Chatty, that's me. My mind is cloudy. It's, it's just garbled and a little, little. This is just step number one. So come on, just begin to say, Holy Spirit, in your own language, reprogram our minds, Lord. We we don't want to be sluggish or sleepy or distracted or wait. It says in Luke 21, 34, we don't want our hearts and minds weighed down by the cares of this world. God, I just pray, everyone standing, Lord, I ask for the 1 Corinthians 2, 16 exchange, for the mind of Christ to be deposited. Father, I wanna pray Ephesians 2, 22 through 24, that this whole church, even today, would be made new in the attitude of their minds, that they would put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. God, we're asking that you would touch the mind of Equippers Central Coast. And maybe right now, just begin to, if, like, repentance is not a drudgery, it's a delight because it leads you further into the fullness of Christ. <laughs> repentance, there's refreshment. Maybe you need to repent for things that are in your mind that are clouding your vision and viewpoint of Christ. Maybe just begin to repent, Lord, I repent for this being in my mind. This, I'm sorry, Lord, that I've, I've given more attention to this or that, but I wanna tune into your voice today. Just right now, talk to Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, transform our minds and our thinking. Thank you, Lord, right now. Touch our minds. And how many would just say, by way of saying amen, that, that there, there needs to be a re, uh, reappropriation of time this summer, of things you're filling your minds with, that are not leading you further into the gospel, but they're, they're actually leading you further to a place of discouragement. Could you just say amen if you're willing to, to talk with Jesus about reappropriating, realigning some of your time this summer to get the mind of Christ? Can you just say amen to that? It's not heavy and gnarly, but it's saying yes to the grace of God. Yes to the grace of God. Maybe, maybe just I'll just finish these next three points. Maybe, maybe you've been hurt in community and the thought of offering love and hospitality freaks you out. Could you stand to your feet that you need God to heal you? <laughs> yeah, a few more are standing if you're not already standing. You would just say, I wanna re-sign up to that long game love. I wanna re-sign up to say yes to becoming a person of hospitality and warmth and welcome. Just lift your hands. Lord, I pray right now for a move of long game, agape, cross-shaped love. I ask for that, the love that is patient, that is kind, that does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it's not easily angered, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs, it doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, always protects, always hopes, always trusts, love never fails. Lord, I pray that, that agape love over this whole body. Father, that we would, we would say yes to long game love, that patient love with each other, even with ourselves. Father, I ask that you would just a tidal wave of hospitality through Equippers Central Coast. God, homes would be open, hearts would be open, tables would be filled with chips and salsa or something, whatever you like. I ask, come on, who wants to see a, t- a movement of hospitality just awakened in the body? How many would say, 
Chatty, I want to say yes to saying yes to hospitality. Just lift your hands. Yeah, I see hands, brother. Thank you. It's so good. This is so good. So, Lord, I ask for grace for hospitality on this body. Homes open, hearts open, Father. Thank you. Conversations, stories shared, sins confessed, grace released. And I want to pray this. If you if you've been in, we're almost done. If you've been unaware of the gifts and graces that God's given you, but you want him to reveal those today or activate those today, can you just lift your hands? Remember, it says each of you should use whatever gift you've received. Come on, nice and high. You say, Chatty, I want God to just unlock something. Pastors, look around at the hands. Keep them hands raised so you can minister for the weeks that come. So Lord, right now, come on, everyone, intercessors, Lord, I ask, release the revelation of the grace that you've given your body for every hand raised, for the gifts and the graces that you've put inside every son and daughter. Lord, we ask that you would activate them. Activate them right now. Father, I thank you for a season, a summer of discovery of the gifts and graces you've given this body. Come on. Hallelujah. From a select few gifted to a mobilized many who are gifted and graced. Amen. Last two. You would say, Chatty, I want to hear God's voice. I want, when I speak, it's like speaking the very words of God. I want to be so seeped and saturated in the word. I want to be so attentive to the spirit that I can speak those John 6, 63 words that are full of spirit and life. If that's you, lift them up nice and high. Come on. Father, I ask, pour out your word, your prophetic word, your spirit on this beautiful body. Every hand raised, Lord, I ask that they would they would literally sense that as they speak in big environments, small environments, in passing, they would do it as if they're speaking your very words. Your very words. And I just want to pray this last prayer for all of us, Lord. I pray for a strengthening. Come on, if anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised. Just put your hand on your precious heart right now in closing. Father, I pray for a strengthening. I pray for a deposit of grace in this spiritual family. Just say it. Just say, I receive fresh grace and fresh strength. As we enter into the summer season, fresh grace and fresh strength. And can we all just say this, so that in all things, Come on, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord just a big shout and say amen? Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that that message was inspiring, encouraging, and hopefully equipped you for life. And if you're looking to get connected with Equippers Church, you can go to equipperscc.com slash connect, fill out a simple form, and someone from our team will be reaching out. You can find all kinds of opportunities to connect, to give, and receive prayer on our website, equipperscc.com. And hey, we really hope to meet you in person sometime, see you in the room. But until then, keep tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by Clippers Church here on YouTube. Love you so much. God bless.